Please look in your Bibles in Genesis chapter 45, and I'd like to share with you our text first this morning, and then I would like for you to just give me your undivided attention for a few moments because I need to tell you some things that lead up to this so that you really understand what's being said here. And I want you to see it with me, if you would, please, again. Genesis chapter 45 and verse 26, and told him, saying, Joseph is yet alive, and he is governor over all the land of Egypt. Jacob's heart fainted, for he believed them not. And they told him all the words of Joseph, which he had said unto them. And when he saw the wagons which Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of Jacob their father revived. Let's pray. Father, meet with us now as only you can and direct us in your word. Help us today to have understanding. Give me clarity of thought today, Lord, and use your word to be a tool in my hand, Lord, to be able to build and to construct in our lives by the Spirit of God a platform on which we can live in a greater way for you. Help us now, we ask. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. You read that verse, and if you don't put it in its context, it just seems to whole hum. And so I want to read it again for you, and then I, I want you to really listen to what's taken place thus far in this situation. Some brothers have returned home, 10 exactly, to tell their dad some of the best news that he would ever receive in his life. They told him, saying, Joseph, one of his sons, is yet alive. And not only is he alive, but he is governor of over all the land of Egypt. And Jacob's heart fainted, for he believed them not. This was something that was so overwhelming to him that his heart would not allow him to believe it. He could not take it in. He could not comprehend it. The Bible says he believed them not, and his heart even fainted. Have you ever had in your heart, and I'm not talking about the muscle of your heart, but I'm talking about in your inner seat of emotions, have you ever had and experienced a hurt or a time of fainting in your heart? Have you ever had something happen to you that was so hurtful and damaging that it hurt? Not physically, but it just got you right there. And well, this is something that Jacob had carried in his life. And so to hear what would seem to us to be great news really, in a sense, hurt him even more. And they told him all the words of Joseph, which he had said unto them. But I want you to notice the next statement. And when he saw the wagons, which Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of Jacob, their father, revived. Boy, I like that statement. Revive us again. I like that song. Revive us again. We praise thee, O God, for the son of thy love. Hey, revive us again. Let our hearts be rekindled with fire from above. Something inside of Jacob was off. Something inside of Jacob had been off for a long time. You see, 20 plus years before, probably closer to 25 years or so before, a bad day in his life took place. His son by the name of Joseph, whom perhaps you've heard of before, usually you associate Joseph with the coat that he wore, his coat of many colors. And that coat of many colors was given to him by his father, his father's name was Jacob. Jacob is a man who, the name Jacob means supplanter, trickster. Jacob is the man who was the descendant of Abraham. There was Abraham who God made promise to. We see this in the book of Genesis. The promise was that he would come from, would spring up from Abraham, a mighty nation. And one of the promises of that was that from that nation, all the nations of the world would be blessed. Abraham is the father of Israel. Abraham would have a son later in life by the name of Isaac. And from Isaac would come Jacob and Esau. And we know the situation that took place between Jacob and Esau. There was a complicated matter. There was some tricking that went on. And because of that, Jacob was on the run and away. And that, that decision and some of those decisions in his life led to other complications for Jacob. And Jacob's life really could be a life that was marked with blessing and a life that was marked with some disappointments too. And yet through it all, God was faithful to Jacob. So faithful was he to Jacob that eventually he would change Jacob's name from trickster or con artist to Israel, prince, one who has power with God. And from Israel and from his children would become the nation, the descendants that you and I hear of even today in the news, the nation of Israel. 
At this point in the stage, they're a family. Two generations now, Abraham, Isaac, and now to Jacob. Jacob has a family of mixed situation with sisters that he took as wives, and there's much to that, but we don't have time to unpack it all. And from that, in that family, there is friction, and there are issues. Well, this is a human experience, is it not? This is something about the Bible, and we touched on that on Wednesday evening. God gives us the nitty-gritty and the details in the lives, even of those that we admire and we look to. You think that your family from time to time might have difficulties. These are some people who knew God in a very unique way who experienced problems as well. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden and sin entered in, so did complications for all of us and in all of our lives. And yet God is faithful and God is good and God is true and God sees us through. Brothers didn't like Joseph. They didn't like him because of the relationship that he had with his dad. He was favored. He was special to his dad. Not only that, God had given Joseph a dream. And in that dream, he saw that his brothers would come before him someday and they would bow before him. And it was figurative in what he saw, but he expressed that to them. And when they heard that, man, they went through the roof. How would you like to hear that the brother that you despise, the brother that's favored by your father, the brother who seemingly has everything going for him, now he's telling you that God has told him, someday you'll bow down before me. Well, they took things into their own hands. They conspired against him. Some would have killed him. Others stepped in and prevented that. And so what they did with Joseph is they sold him off into slavery. This was God's plan. Seemingly, as we look back on it, we would say, wow, that is a pretty difficult path that God has charted for Joseph. And it was difficult, I'm sure. But here's a promise that we see throughout Joseph's life. The Lord was with him. And man, Joseph would go through it. And we'll touch on that in a moment. But not only would Joseph go through it, but in Genesis chapter 37, his brothers had to do something. They sold Joseph off into slavery. And now they had to come home to their dad and try to explain or do something with closure when it comes to Joseph and their father. So they brought his garment, his coat of many colors. It had animal's blood on it and they gave it to him. And the statement was made, surely a wild animal has torn him to pieces. And that father grieved the loss of his son. It's one thing to sell your brother into slavery. I have a brother and I can kind of relate to that. I would go and get him back after a while. That's one thing. But to break the heart of your father? He took that loss very difficultly. As you can imagine, probably in this room today, there are people who have experienced the loss of a child. I don't know of anything in this life that I believe would be, could be as difficult as that, to have that experience. But suddenly, seemingly in a way that would uh, un, unnecessarily for a wild animal to attack him and his life to be taken, he took that garment. And in my mind's eye, I hear a father grieve. I hear him weep. Not for just a moment, but for the rest of his life. I suspect he composed himself at times, and I suspect that there were times when he would maybe get past a little bit, but then maybe there would become a reminder of that. Maybe when all the family was gathered together, he would think about Joseph. Maybe he thought about what might have been in Joseph's life. What could have been for Joseph? He was young at the time that he was taken off, late teens, seemingly lost to Jacob. Years will pass. A famine will come into the land that Jacob and his children live in. He has an idea. He says, I want you to go to Egypt and I want you to take money and I want you to buy bread and I want you to come back and care for our family. And so those brothers do, having no idea what's become of Joseph. We know that behind the scenes, God has been working. Joseph ended up in a home where he was treated fairly for a while, and then he was lied about. And then he was treated very unfairly, even in his servitude when he tried to be a good servant and did, was trustworthy at times and, and could be trusted. Then he was turned on, and so from that he ended up in prison. And while in prison, he was forgotten. 
But eventually, through God's process, he brought Joseph through and positioned Joseph as the second in command of all of Egypt. You remember that God had given a vision to the Pharaoh and Joseph interpreted this and talked about seven years of plenty and seven years of famine and talked about how they needed to store things up. And so the Egyptians did that. And because of that, e Egypt flourished because of God's hand in Joseph's life. Now these years have passed and Joseph, no doubt, looking like he's an Egyptian, communicating and speaking like he's an Egyptian, sees his brothers come into his presence. And for time's sake, he toys with them a little bit. He listens to their testimony, he gets information out of them. He doesn't reveal himself to them. He causes then one of his brethren by the name of Simeon to remain back. And he says, the only way you can have him back is if you go home and get Benjamin, that other brother that you spoke of. He had gotten that information from them. They had no idea that Joseph was this one that was the one that they were dealing with. They went back home and they told their dad, they said, dad, we had to leave Simeon behind. And the only way we can get him back is if we bring Benjamin to see this man. To, he wants to validate who we are and that we've told him the truth in all matters. And Jacob says, absolutely not. I've already lost Joseph. I will not lose Benjamin. We'll starve if that's what it takes. That tells me that that hurt was still there. Those brothers, for all those years, held a lie so close to their chest, a lie that hurt their family, a lie that created conflict in their father's heart. A lie that brought grief and sorrow. And I can take a lot of things. And I can deal with a lot of things. But there are a few things that really move me. When I see people that I love weep, I, I'm moved by that. Right? When I was a kid, if I hurt my mother and I saw my mother cry, whatever I had done, even if I hadn't done it, I was willing to confess to it. Please, Mom, don't cry, right? When my wife on occasion tears up, I find myself tearing up. My kids, not so much. I usually told them to straighten up and act right now. Uh -huh. Oh, can you imagine hearing your father grieve and knowing all that time? And I just wonder, maybe in the human experience, could be wrong, but just people being people, I wonder if one brother didn't look at another brother at some point and say, hey, we really ought to own up to this. We really ought to tell dad what's up. We really ought to tell him what happened. At least he would have the hope in knowing that what happened to Joseph. I don't know if it's so, but it seems like it could bear out that one might say, hey man, you tell them that, the whole thing falls apart. Keep your mouth shut. Be quiet. So this has been covered up. Joseph has sent them home. Lean times turn even leaner and to the point where finally one of the brothers says to his dad, dad, you've got to let us go back to Egypt. You've got to let us take Benjamin. I swear on my life, if you'll let me take him, I'll bring him back to you. I promise you, Dad, let me take him. And so they go back now to see Joseph and Benjamin is with them. And Joseph hears them. Their conversation is fantastic. You ought to read it. It's in the book of Genesis. He hears them. He understands what they're saying. And they don't realize that he understands them. The Bible says here that Joseph, in hearing those things, he turns from them and he begins to weep. And he turns back to them and he comes into them and he tells them who he is. He said, I'm your brother, Joseph. It's me. I'm here. And there's a reunion, right? And Joseph says to them, I want you to do something. I want you to go home. And I want you to go and get dad. And I want you to bring him here. I want to see dad. The Pharaoh hears about it and he says, hey, listen, I want to help you in that. You take my wagons. You take anything you need. Livestock is taken. Supply is taken. Garments are given. Wealth is given. He said, you go back and you Tell Jacob, Joseph's dad, that he lives, and you bring him here. You give him an escort. You bring him in royal style. What's well, a tremendous picture today of salvation. There's God the Father. There's Christ the Son. There's Jacob in the faraway land. There's God the Father saying, I want Jacob to be restored to me. There's the Son saying, I'll pay the price. I'll be the wagon. He comes to this earth, he lives, he dies, he's buried, he rises again. And now he stands ready to carry us in reunion 
to our Father. And what's necessary in that? That you believe. It's a beautiful picture of salvation. I hope today, and I don't, that's not where I'm going to go with this, but if you're here this morning and you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, hey, listen, the wagon is ready to carry you to God. Jesus is the wagon. He loves you. Consider all the wagon did for him. It was a situation of from death to life, right? To carry him in. So the brothers go home, right? And they tell the dad, Dad, we've got something to tell you. Now this hadn't happened a year before. It hadn't happened a couple months before. It happened 25 plus years before. For 25 years, Jacob had carried in his heart and in his mind that Joseph, the son that he loved, is dead, torn apart by wild animals. I wonder if he hadn't kept that coat wrapped up and put somewhere. I wonder if on occasion he didn't take it out and look at it perhaps and consider it. Certainly in his mind's eye, he would have traveled back to that and considered that. I wonder how many times he saw a sunset or he's heard the laughter of a child or he looked upon grandchildren now that have come into his life. I wonder how many times he thought about Joseph. He said, Dad, we need to tell you something. Joseph is alive. Joseph is alive. And not only is he alive, but he is the governor over all of Egypt. Dad, you thought he was dead, and you thought that his dreams, his desires, his direction had been silenced. But it hasn't. He's not only alive, Dad, but God, God has spared him and given him what? A position of authority. When Jacob heard that, it was too much to take in. He could not bear up underneath of it. His heart, the Bible says, fainted. And it wasn't an exaggerated fainting. Sometimes I, oh, that was not the case. It really, I mean, he was affected by it. Well, imagine how he would be affected by that. And they told him next all the what? Words of Joseph. Joseph is alive, and this is what Joseph has said. And still it seems as if Jacob had a hard time processing it. Until, what the Bible says, and when he saw the what? When he saw the wagons. I don't know, maybe it played out this way. They talked to their dad, they went into the tent. He's sitting down, dad, you need to sit down. We have something we need to tell you. Dad, we have found Joseph. He is alive and he is the governor of all of Egypt. He's second in command. And not only have we found him, and here he is, I can't believe this, I can't, I can't bear up under this. Not only that, Dad, but, but these are his words towards us. He spoke good words towards us. He wants to receive us. He wants us to come to be with him. Even after hearing the words, seemingly, Jacob is still having a hard time processing it. And then one of them said, look, Dad, come here. Let me show you something. Come here, Dad. Look outside the tent. And then they opened up the tent flap. And what did he see? He saw wagons lined up. Wagons to pick up the whole family and to carry them all to where Joseph was at. Again, what a tremendous picture of salvation. Joseph wanted to be restored, sending to his brethren to come to him, offering them the means of transportation, the wagon to get there. And when he saw the wagons, the Bible says that the spirit of Jacob, their father, did something. It revived. He went from thinking that Joseph was dead and his dreams and his direction silenced to believing now. My son is alive. And he's not just alive. He is somebody. But more than that, he has sent a wagon to me because he wants to be restored to me. Oh, the thrill. The thrill. Look at verse 28. And Israel said, it is enough. Joseph, my son, is yet alive. I will go and see him before I die. And I don't know everything about that expression, but I think maybe one could say this. All the things, see, they weren't just going to get to see Joseph again, but now they were going to experience all the fruit, all the blessing of Egypt. 
Maybe it was just simply to say, it is enough that I get to see my son again. It doesn't matter. The rest of that stuff, that doesn't matter. What I get is this reunion with Joseph there. I have something today. Bring it in, would you please? I wanted to bring in more, but for fear of making a mess on the carpet, I did not. I have a pony who pulls a wagon. His name is Kalijah. He really wanted to come to church with you today. But that could be a problem. This is a wagon. Here's the crazy thing about this. Not only does our little horse pull the wagon, but last year we hooked the donkey. We have a, I had this pony, and somebody said it's not healthy for him to be by himself. He can stop right there. Th this is not the horse or the donkey. That's Garrett, okay? <laughs> Thank you, Garrett. Garrett's a good sport. He helps me with the livestock. Wait, somebody says it's not good for that pony to be by himself, so you need to get a, a companion. So I got to look at it and said, what's a cheap companion, you know? And somebody said, a mini donkey. All right, a mini donkey it is. So we have a mini donkey named Hank. Last summer, without any training, we hooked the donkey up to the wagon. And, and what, you know what that donkey did? Pulled the wagon, man, like he'd been trained to do it forever. I don't know if Kalijah's a good example, a good testimony to him or what, but here's the wagon. When Jacob looked out, he saw a wagon. That wagon meant something to him. It meant a means of what? A means of transportation. A means of what? Getting me back and all of us to a place with Joseph and a place where there's abundance of food. You see, it was more, listen to me, it was more than just hearing that Joseph was alive. It was more than just hearing the words of Joseph. It was seeing the actions of Joseph. We have spent the month of February and now the first Sunday of March, we started out talking about charity, a love that gives. Last Sunday morning, we considered the Apostle Paul and the Macedonian call, come over to Macedonia and help us. And we talked about, and we broke that down, what that looks like. May I say this to you this morning? Action brings traction. Action brings traction. It was more than just where Joseph is and what Joseph has said, it was the action of dad. He wants to help us and he wants to bring you to him. And when he looked out and he saw that wagon, he said, I believe it. I get it. I see it. We send buses out every Wednesday night. We send buses out on Sunday mornings. They're modern day wagons. You know what they're wagons that say? There's a God in heaven who loves you, who's given his son for you. And we, as a people, love him and want you to know him enough that we'll do something. And what is that? We'll put action out there. We'll put action out there. You go out and knock on somebody's door. You go to a nursing home. You go to a hospital. You make a visit with somebody. You help a neighbor when they have a need. You find out that they're sick and they can't do something. And you step in and you fill that void in their life. And then you hand them the gospel. You go for more than talking about Jesus and the fact that he lives and where he lives. You're doing more than simply giving his words, which don't, please don't miss this. I'm not diminishing that at all. But when you begin to put action to your message, when you begin to put action to the one that you're telling them about, there is something that begins to happen and begins to be established. For far too long, we have left this part out of living in ministry. This is ministry. Ministry is doing what Paul did and coming over into Macedonia and helping us. Ministry is what? Providing the means. Going to the next step of what do I need to do to help you to experience what God has for you. The wagon is telling somebody, hey, I could pick you up and bring you to Bible study if you'd like to come. Hey, the action is saying to somebody, hey, is there something around your home that I could do to help to fill that need? The action is what? The action of the wagon is doing what? It's giving and offering up from our life and what our substance to others that those needs might be met. What is it? It's not just simply saying, I know somebody to pray to and I'm going to pray for you. It's coming alongside of them in their time of need and saying, hey, let's pray together. It's that guy who's riding along in a chariot and he's reading and he's looking through the Old Testament and God brings a preacher and puts him alongside of him and he says, hey, hey, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I? Unless somebody what, shows me or guides me or instructs me. What a wagon. 
speaks of action. The wagons of God and of course the assurances of God. So many things could be said, but time would not allow. God has done so many things for us to experience and for us to know that he's real in the life of the believer. And those are the things that are to revive our spirit. But as those who are involved in ministry, I want to challenge us to send out the wagon. You see, that wagon represents some things. It represents in Joseph's life faithfulness. It represents that Joseph, for all those years of difficulty, hey, think about this for a moment. Joseph has heard from the Pharaoh, send out my wagons to go and pick up your family and bring them here. That didn't happen overnight. That didn't happen over a week. That happened over years of being faithful. That happened over years of doing right in the face of adversity. That happened in years of being lonely and longing for his and for his own, but he remained faithful and he did right, and he was in a position to do something to send the wagons. That wagon also speaks in Joseph's behalf of what? Forgiveness. He didn't say send one wagon to bring my dad to me. He said send all the wagons and get everybody and bring everybody here where I'm at. Hey, what action is needed today in your life? What wagon should be sent out? Faithfulness, forgiveness. That wagon also spoke to Jacob and his family about what? Fruitfulness. There's a better life. There's a better opportunity for you. Do you know that there are people today who are sitting in life looking and wondering if there's anything better for them in this world? There are people who become so burdened and so broke down by sin and by decisions and sometimes by the sin and decisions of others that they're sitting today wondering, does anybody care? Is there anybody that loves me? Is there anything any better than this? When we get our lives together in a way and we use our life as that wagon to speak of and we're coming to people and we're saying more than just simply being passive and saying, These are the, this is the Lord that we serve. These are his words. Now let me do something. Let me be what I'm called to be, an ambassador. And what does an ambassador do? An ambassador says, I pray you in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. The church is silent at times. We sit on our hands and we watch the world spin by and we wonder why there's no difference being made. Hey, we've got to send out the wagon. The wagon of faithfulness. That wagon represents forgiveness. That wagon represents fruitfulness. That wagon also spoke to Jacob of life and death. He had believed all those years that Joseph was dead and now he had heard what? that he was alive and the wagon was going to bring him into a totally different perspective of life. You know how many people their perspective of life is this is all there is and then it's over and then what? But you and I, we know something, don't we? I know where I'm going. I know how I'm getting there. I know who's punched my ticket, who's paid my way. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. We want to help people to know that, right? Life and death. You know, the things of God and ministry and working with people and loving people, instructing people in the things of God, it's life and death. On occasion, folks will visit church and say, man, preacher, I I really appreciate the fact that you raise your voice a little bit. Appreciate the fact that there's a little bit of passion behind what you're doing. Why would there be? Hey, if a basketball coach yesterday as I was making a visit at a hospital, if someone had a ball game on and the coach was up, I mean, he was hot. Over the fact that the ball got, he thought the ball got knocked out of bounds and his team wasn't going to get it. Man, he was out on the court. His face was red. He was yelling at a referee for all the world to see because he wanted to make sure his team, who was winning by 10, got possession of the basketball. If a guy who's getting paid millions of dollars to play a game and coach a game, coach players, and get that passionate over a lost opportunity for his team to get the basketball back? What's wrong with us? You see, Jacob sat there. And he heard that Joseph was alive. And he even heard what Joseph said. And his heart was still fainting and he was still not believing. And they said, well, Dad, let me show you the action of Joseph. I've led people to the Lord before. 
several. And when I was finished, I'll never forget this, almost verbatim. I was waiting for someone to show me and to care enough about me to lead me in this. I was waiting. Well, you say if they knew the gospel issue. That's why we're here. Do you understand what you're reading? How can I? Unless somebody shows me. Don't you get it? Our life and the action of our life and the motion and the energy of our life being directed into what? Into telling people that he's alive and being and telling people of his promises, but then also doing what? Sending the wagons. Send the wagon. Every gospel believing, every gospel preaching church ought to be sending wagons out everywhere they can. Letting the world know we believe this and we want you to have this and we know this to be so. There are many ways to minister to people in different places. Some cultures don't have the same opportunities that we have. Not everybody has the opportunity to run buses and pick people up on buses and have bus ministries like we do. I don't think that everybody has to have one. Don't mistake that. I believe it's something that's an open door for us, and I believe as long as we have that open door, we should step through it. I think it's a testimony to the community when they see our bus rolling around. Hey, there's some folks there. They're either nuts or they believe something. Maybe both are true. Right? I know that everybody appreciates a gospel witness on their doorstep when you go by and you knock on their door and you say, hey, just want to tell you the best news you'll ever hear. Jesus saves. Not everybody, oh, I don't think you ought to do that. Okay. But you understand that there could be a Jacob waiting behind the door who's just waiting for somebody to show some love and put it in action. If it wasn't that way, then why would we be directed to be that ambassador that we're called to be? Wagons speak of action, and action brings traction. That's how you get people going. You want to help somebody? You want to love somebody to Jesus? Then start loving them to Jesus. Start getting some action going. Live that life, right? And witness and tell him he lives. Don't mistake it. But when, we, when you compound, when you put the three of those together, the message that he lives, the message of his word, and the message of my life being lived for him in action and in service, well, it's a powerful witness. Who wants to ride in a wagon? JJ, can he pull you? You think you can pull him, Garrett? Hop in the wagon and pull him out, would you please? Go ahead, JJ, only because I want to see it happen. Going to take both handles there, Garrett. Come on. There we go. Give Garrett a big hand. He did a good job. JJ, you want a whip or what? Shh, shh. Would have been so much better if Kalijah had brought the wagon in. Can we all agree on that point? It was here in my mind. It was my junior high brain was thinking, that I'm bringing the horse into church today. I'm bringing that horse into church today. But there's somebody here, my dad. Who would have said afterwards, son, I don't know that that was the best thing to do. I mean, and I know what Kalijah would have done. He'd have come right in front here. And he would have done what Kalijah does, all right? And you would have laughed, but I'd have heard about it for the rest of my life, right? Hey, that wagon, faithfulness, and Joseph offering forgiveness. Let me close with this. Maybe that wagon today isn't being sent because... There is a lack of forgiveness. Maybe there's somebody we need to forgive. Maybe we need to recognize the Lord's forgiveness in our life so we can serve him that way. But man, when he heard that he lived, and he heard his words, and then when he saw the wagons, he said what? I believe. I'm going there. Hey, I want to be a good wagon, don't you? Huh? I was going to sing the theme to Rawhide too. How many of you know it? Head them up. Or how about this one? Keep them doggies rolling, 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 rolling. Some of you who are under a certain age, you're not looking. Haven't you visited? When you visit people who were born before 1965, all they watch now is the Western Channel. And, and quite honestly, every time I encounter you over born before 1965 and you tell me, Pastor, did you know that there's Westerns on all the time? I know this. Yeah, I did know this, because every time I come to any of your houses, the old westerns are on, right? And the guy who wouldn't let me bring the horse into church, he, 
read that, son, you got to see this episode of Rifleman. <laughs> it's the same story over and over again. Come on. Huh? Yeah. Wagons. Get the wagon rolling, man. Think about it. Right here, right now, this week, what can you do to demonstrate to somebody and represent the one who lives, whose words we know, what kind of action could you put to that? Well, you get grab you a stack of tracks on the way out, and you could talk to somebody. We shared that with you last week. You could find a neighbor. Maybe, maybe you've got neighbors you've never even met. You could introduce yourself. You could find out what you might be able to do to be a help to them. You could instruct your children in that way, how to do that, to help them that way, right? Maybe you go visit somebody in a hospital or visit somebody in a nursing home or hear of something going on in somebody's life and care for them. I get it that we pray for people, but maybe, maybe there should be more of us coming up alongside of people and saying, hey, can I pray with you? Could I pray with you for your loved one? Could I pray with you about that situation? You're going through it. Can I come alongside of you in that? So remember that action gets traction going. Things get going that way, right? Somebody showed love to me in my life, in my ministry. They took time. They invested in me. They were the wagon in my life, so to speak. They invited me to come alongside of them, to be involved in things. They took time to mentor me and to talk to me, to disciple me. Hey, be that wagon. Be that wagon. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your goodness. Thank you, Lord, for the truth of God's word. We trust, Lord, that you'll use it in each of our lives. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. If you're here this morning, you'd say, Preacher, I don't know for sure that I'm saved and on my way to heaven. I don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior, but I'd like to know him. Right there at your seat today, if you'd say, Preacher, I am not sure, I am not 100% sure if I were to die right now that I would be in the presence of the Lord. And that's the promise for the saved. But you say, Preacher, I don't have that promise. I don't know for sure I'm going to heaven when I die. Preacher, please pray for me. Would you lift your hand? Who would say that? Preacher, I'm not sure that I'm saved. Please pray for me. I've, I, I've come to church. I've heard the gospel presented. But I don't know that. There is something, preacher, that you have spoken of that I do not have. I do not have that understanding. Once you're right there at your seat this morning. If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior today, as a junior high boy, I recognized a few things. Number one, I recognized that I was a sinner. Number two, I recognized that God loved me. It's like in that little picture that we gave a moment ago. God loved me so much that he sent Jesus to this earth to be my wagon. Jesus came. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. He lived and died and rose again so that he could be the wagon to carry me to God. What have I got to do? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. When I understood that God who made me also wanted to save me, when I understood that that means of salvation was through Christ and by me believing Him, by trusting Him, by accepting Him, well, I did. I'm thankful for that. Right there at your seat today, if you say, Preacher, right here, right now, I know I'm a sinner in need of a Savior, and I believe that Jesus lived and died and rose again to be that wagon, to be that mediator, to bring me to God, and I want to put my faith in Him. Right here today, preacher, I want to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior. Would you lift your hands and I might pray for you? You'd say, preacher, I want to believe on Christ today as my Savior. If you're here this morning, say, preacher, I know that I'm saved. I know that I'm going to heaven when I die because Jesus Christ is the one who saved me. I know this. I'm rejoicing in my salvation today. Would you lift your hand? you say, preacher, I know that I'm saved. Wonderful. If this morning you could not raise your hand, oh, I want you to know that so desperately. There's a God in heaven who gave his son for you that you might be restored to him. I hope and pray that you would allow somebody to share the gospel with you. There are men and ladies in our church who would love to sit with you and guide you in the scripture to help you to understand. There are people who love you and love God and would take that time with you if you'd let them. If you're here this morning and say, Preacher, I get the message and I need to be a wagon. I need to be a wagon of action. I need to tell people about the Lord that he lives. I need to tell them about his word, but I also need my life to be like a wagon. I need to be out showing and evidencing what I'm talking about. And you'd say, preacher, please pray for me. I want to be in my life. I want to be like that wagon that Joseph sent. Would you lift your hand? You'd say, preacher, there was something in that for me today. Father in heaven, you see our hands. You know our needs in our lives. You know what growth and development is required. We trust, Lord, that you'll work. Lord Jesus, you're a good shepherd. You, you bring us along, and we trust today that you'll bring us along. Here in just a moment, we'll stand to our feet. We have someone that's come today to follow the Lord and believers' baptism. If you've been saved and not yet scripturally baptized, we encourage you to do the same. Let someone show you and guide you in the scripture and make sure you have good understanding of baptism and what it is and why it is. If that's you today, if you'd say, Preacher, I'm saved, but I've never been baptized. 
I've never followed the Lord in believer's baptism. You'd say, preacher, please pray for me. I'm saved but not baptized. Preacher, please pray for me. Would you lift your hand? Who would say that? Preacher, please pray for me. I'm not baptized. If this morning you have questions about that, see one of us on the way out. See one of the staff in the lobby and let us know. Let us help you with that. If this morning you have somebody on your heart, a need, a situation, I invite you to come to the altar. If this morning it's to come and to say, Lord, I surrender to be a wagon. I want my life to express like Joseph did. I want it in my relationships. I want it for those that I meet, those that I encounter in life. Sometimes a little bit of action go a long ways with somebody.